Uh, I'm Piers Campbellidge. Um, I have been working in investing, private equity investing in emerging markets for a number of years. At the moment, I and some partners are working together to build an investment manager investing in sustainable agriculture, primarily in Africa and Latin America. It's a company called Global Sustainable Capital Management based in London. It's the pitch is the most important part um, of you actually making first contact with an investor. People talk about elevator pitches, they talk about your 30 second elevator pitch. Don't worry about that. The most important thing is really preparing for the main meeting you're going to have with the investor. And for that you've got to be really well prepared. Um, it's not a question of sending out your raw Excel spreadsheets. You've got to put together a presentation that is going to catch the investor's imagination. You've got to wow them and so you've got to tell a story. And that story is very personal. It's the story of how you found the business, how you had the idea, why you want to build this business and how you're going to do it. And that's the most important piece of the pitch. You come to the numbers later, there's going to be lots of financial detail. If the investors are excited, they'll dig into that and there'll be due diligence going through it in all sorts of levels of detail. But the most important thing is tell them the story. You've got to show them that you have a vision, that you know what it is, that you've got a strategy for the business, and then build trust with them. You've got to build trust that you really understand it. So you've got to go into enough detail for them to think that you are someone who is reliable, someone they can have confidence in to actually run this business, to pick it up, run the business, take their money, invest it well, make money for yourself and for them. And in order to do that, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to tell them about the detail, but don't sweat it at the first point. Tell the story, put in some key numbers, key facts, the scale is going to be particularly important because that's helping them to understand where you fit in their universe and where you fit in the whole product and market universe. And so work through a few points of detail, but don't go over detailed. Don't go long winded on the detail. Just that's going to come later. That'll come towards the back end of it. The first thing really in that pitch then is um, the picture, the overall story. The next thing, the next key thing is the team. Who are you? Who am I who wants to actually run this business? Who are the people who are going to do it with me? Who's my CFO? Who's the person in charge of the product? Who's actually going to make it? Uh, who's going to sell it? And how do we work together? That's also absolutely critical. Um, and that story is something, again, that is very personal. It's conveying to the investor how strong you are, how comfortable you are with your partners, how well you know each other. We'll come on to the detail of the team a little bit later, but, uh, and, and it's a very important part of the overall pitch to the investors. But you've got to get that across fairly early on in your conversation with them. Um, so perhaps you know, well, a way of remembering it is don't go into the how much right at the beginning. You go into the what, the why, and the who. And those are absolutely critical. Then you can start to go into the when, which is all about your timelines, how long it's going to take you to build the business, and you go into the, then you go into the how much as well. You go into the how, the operational side of it, but the how much, which is really going to be the detail of the numbers. But again, in your first pitch to the investors, the first presentation to them, that is not the most important thing. It's at the back of your pack. It's not at the front of your pack. Then, as you're talking to the investors, you need to try and engage them to understand what it is that they want. Um, look for and ask them questions about what sort of investments they do, why they do those investments. Show them at the same time, though, that you've researched them. You know all about them. You've done your research. You've probably spoken to other companies they've invested in. They've got to have a sense that you have come really prepared to the meeting, that you know that you're going to be um, uh, you know, trying to persuade them, but at the same time, you want them to persuade you that they are the right people to invest in you. Ask them questions about the value they create. Ask them questions about how they work with investors. They will have different view. They will have different stories to tell you. Um, 
And you need to make sure that those stories are ones that you're confident with as well. It's, it's a two-way process. Yes, at the beginning you're selling your story to them, but you're then asking them to come towards you. Um, remember, investors are going to be around with you for a few years. It's three years, five years, longer than that even. And you've got to feel very comfortable that they're going to be a part of your business's life. Um, and so you can ask them some fairly probing questions. And probably the final really key piece in all of this is don't be in a hurry. Yes, you want your money urgently. Every, invest, every entrepreneur wants their money tomorrow. But don't be in a hurry. And above all, don't hustle. Don't be arrogant. Don't come across as, I know what I need. I'm great. If you don't want to come along, I've got plenty of other people waiting for me. That's the first way, fastest way to turn off the investors. They'll just walk out the room and you won't see them anymore. Don't be in a hurry. Be patient. You're building a relationship. And you want them to be saying, yeah, this guy was nice. We'd like this person to come back. Um, be, you know, be, be, be very open and honest with them. Um, talk about if you are in a hurry because you need the money urgently. Say that you are, but at the same time, don't try and pressure them. Say, yes, and I'm talking to the banks. I'm looking at getting money out of the banks. I've got a line which may come through. I hope that it'll come through in time. Um, but at the same time, I'm talking to you because I know you're going to take your time doing your investment diligence, and I want to start that process now. Um, ask them also about their process and timelines. Ask them, how do you do it? What is your process? When are your investment committees? How long does it normally take you? Um, Again, without trying to hustle them on it, but just in order to get from them the clear understanding so that you know how they are going to be able to come in and help you at the right time. Let, let, let me finish this section then by really highlighting the key points um, that I've been making just now. Firstly, tell the story. Concentrate on telling a coherent story. Secondly, use that story to build trust with the investor, for the investor to feel really confident that you know what you're on about, you know your business, and you know how you're going to run that business over a number of years in order to make money. Thirdly, don't focus too much on the detail of the numbers at the moment. Yes, you need to show that you are in control and you, you actually know them, but at the same time, don't spend too much time on that detail. That's going to come out in later due diligence and much more detailed discussions with the investors. And final point, ask the investors, have a conversation with them, ask the investors how they're going to approach your pitch, how they are going to approach your proposal, how it is, how long, what their process is, what their timelines are. The team is the most critical piece for an investor of any part of your investment pitch, any part of your proposal. The old adage, you know, in real estate, people talk about location, location, location. In investing, it's management, management, management. And that is absolutely critical. And the reason is very simple. It's because the investor is entrusting his cash or her cash to you and you're going to make money on it, but they want to make absolutely certain that they feel really comfortable you're the people who are going to be able to do that well. And part of it's just simply the, the trust aspect that they want to make sure you're not going to run off with that money, but they've got all sorts of ways of protecting that. Much more importantly is, are you able to do a better job than they are or a better job than someone else is at actually making money for them by taking their investment and, and really making it work well? So you have to bring together a team. If you're a one-person a one band, uh, it's very difficult to really build a business. You need people around you who are going to help you to do that. And you bring together a team which you present. Now, one of the most critical things about that, and I as an investor have always used this as my sort of comment to entrepreneurs, is I want to see a constellation. I don't want to see a group of stars. You can bring together, you can show me a team where you've got a CFO who's a brilliant CFO and you've got a manufacturing person who's fantastic and the most wonderful marketing lady. But unless I really feel that between all of you, 
there is connectivity and that you can work well together as a team, then I'm going to be very cautious. I will look at each individual and I'll say, that's fine. But I'll say, okay, now tell me how it is that you're going to make this work together. Because just as I'm going to be an investor in your business for three, five, seven years, you're all going to be working together for three, five, seven years. You're going to be running and building that business. And I want to make sure that you're going to be comfortable working together, that you're going to be able not only to do it because you're brilliant, but actually to work as a team. That you're going to be able, particularly, to have really rough conversations with each other and come out of those. You know, you're going to have those, those angry fights that everyone has in a business, but you come out of it still focused on making the business work. So what do we need in the team? Over, over, across the whole team, what do we really want to see? We need to have you being strategic and with a clear vision. That's, that's absolutely impo uh, critical. And we need to feel, as investors, that if the business goes a little bit off course, that you're going to be able either to say, this new course is going to be more profitable, or to bring it back on course. So that's very important too. That is a little bit related, really, to your ability to execute. But it's also the strategy behind that course definition. But then you've got to have an ability to execute. It's great to have wonderful ideas, but unless you can translate those ideas into a business that generates cash, then that's no use to any of us. We need you to be a safe pair of hands. We don't want you to be taking unnecessary risk, because you're taking unnecessary risk with our money. We need you to understand how to scale up the business, because we're investing in a small business and we're expecting it to grow. We need to understand that you're going to be able to do that, that you're not going to reach a limit in the market or at the size of the business, a limit of competence, which means that actually either we've got to really work with you to change management, and that may mean changing you, or the business is going to just hit a wall and not grow anymore, and we won't get the returns we're looking for. We need you to have a really deep understanding of the environment. That's the local environment you're working in and the broader market environment, because you've got to be able to navigate that where, again, we're trusting you to know that because we don't know it. We don't know all the details of what's around, but we have to believe that you really do. We want you to be very clear on your decision-making. We want to understand how it is that you, as the CEO and founder, how you make decisions, how you take decisions with your CFO, with your marketing person, in a way which actually means that all of you are aligned in that decision, but that you don't take too long. You're not into analysis paralysis, that you actually make decisions and get on with it, but you can do that as a group together. We like you to tell us also, and this is when you're pitching to the investor about the team, one of the best things you can do is talk about your war stories. Talk about the scars you've got. Don't just talk about how wonderful everything is. Talk also about the problems you've had. It's like a job interview. You know, when a job interview and the interviewer says to you, well, what was a challenge you had and how did you overcome it? Exactly the same thing. We need to know how you overcame the challenge. We need to understand because that helps us to sort of helps us to calibrate and helps us to say, okay, these people have been around the block. They've had some rough patches, but they've come out of those rough patches. I'd much rather know someone who's done that than someone who's always had a rosy trajectory because at some stage the problems are going to happen and I want to know how they're going to deal with it. Another thing around the team, that's your core team. The other thing is surround yourself with good advisors. You need to get a challenging board. Try and build a board of people who are not going to be just simply saying yes. It's not an approval mechanism. A board is really there to challenge you. It's to ask you about your strategy. It's to press you on your strategy. It's to press you on risks and make sure that they, you understand the risks and that they feel comfortable you do. It's to press you on your numbers, which is actually really all about execution, and to make sure that you really know how to do that well. But so surround yourself with advisors who can be really challenging. Try and get mentors. Um, get a board, which is good. Construct a board that is good. Show that board. It may just be an advisory board. You're a young business. You can't afford to pay for a very big professional board. Just an advisory board. But they've got to be friends who are prepared to be tough with you. And that will really stand out well with the investors as well. Um, look for mentors. Try and get a mentor in the same business that you're investing in. 
Maybe that mentor is one day going to be part of your exit route. But get a mentor who's really able to say to you now, I've been around the block on this. I know what happens in this business. I've seen this before. I've seen that before. Try and get someone like that alongside you. And one little caveat about the team, um, be careful about politicians and politically exposed people, persons, the peps, because that can scare off the investors. You may be tempted, if you've got a business which has got some kind of regulatory environment, you know, you're in a telecoms business or you need licenses, you may say, oh, well, I got the local MP on my board or whatever. Don't, don't. It, it, it scares investors. The world doesn't work that way anymore. It may work that way, but it shouldn't work that way. Okay. So just coming then to conclude on this particular topic, the key pieces that I really want to talk about for the team, make sure that you have a constellation rather than just a group of individual stars who aren't linked together. Secondly, really convey to the investors all of the various different aspects of a business that that team can look after, the competencies that they bring together. And thirdly, surround yourself with good advisors. This, this is a critical part of the relationship that's going to be between you and the investors. Um, and, and you have to understand what the objectives are first, and then you've got to come to an alignment. Because if you have a misalignment, then you're going to have a really unhappy time together. It's like that, you know, the old metaphor of an unhappy marriage because actually you thought you were doing or wanted different things. Um, investors, very simply, want to make money. And in order to make money, they don't have the time, they don't have the resources, they don't have the intelligence. You're the one with the intelligence, so that is an investor. They don't have the intelligence and they don't have, particularly, they don't have the knowledge of the particular business to be able to do it better than you. So they want you to do it for them and make money for them. You need them because you need that money. And it's pretty simple. I mean, you need that money, but there's some other things you can get from them as well, going above and beyond the money, because they can bring value, they can help you by bringing connectivity, they can have fantastic networks, they can know other people in the same businesses um, or similar businesses. They may be able to help you bulk up by either acquiring or merging, setting up partnerships. But come back to the basic principle. You and they have got to find a way where you actually have your objectives coming together. And in order to do that, um, you've got to be very transparent with each other. You've got to take the time to talk about it. You've got to say to them, okay, what do you want? What are you really looking for? Are you looking for a multiple of four times cash in two years? If so, I'm not the right business for you to do that. On the other hand, if you're, and you're looking for that with a lot of risk, I'll give you four times cash in five years, but with much less risk. Now, that then starts to be part of this alignment because you're believing and you're conveying to them, it's going to take you five years to build the business to that scale. They've got to understand that. They've got to understand that that is what you want to do and that if they try and accelerate it, it's going to derail the strategy. Now, there's always going to be some tension and negotiation around it, but you've got to lay down fundamentally those guidelines right at the beginning. How long and how much you are looking to make and they are looking to make. The next piece of this is that bit of the split. Now, what is it reasonable for you as an entrepreneur to expect to make out of all the sweat and the time that you put into this? What is it reasonable for them to expect to make putting their money into your business? And there's got to be a sense of balance there because if there is any sense of imbalance, then there is constantly going to be tension in the relationship between you. As, you. as you talk about this alignment with them, just run through various scenarios, run through them with them as well. And those scenarios are, okay, you put 100,000 into my business now, how much money are you gonna make on that in those five years? And how much money am I going to make because the business has done this, okay? And 
There will be all sorts of bells and whistles which will be attached to their offer. They will make a, they'll do a term sheet which will have all sorts of conditions. It will say that uh, if you leave the business within three years, then you forfeit all your stock. Um, that within five years, if it hasn't been sold or IPO'd or sold to another investor, then they're going to have the right to force you to buy it back at a price which is X multiple of revenue or whatever it may be, or of EBITDA. Um, they're going to put in a whole series of conditions and handcuffs and you're going to say, but that doesn't let me run the business and give me the independence to run the business. All of these things are questions of building the trust around the alignment. And you've got to be aligned in terms of what you're trying to achieve together. Um, exits, the exit is the critical thing as, as part of it. How long do you want them to be in your business? How long do you expect it to take to build the business to a point where they're satisfied to go out or where you can sell the business? Now, don't forget, businesses take, typically it takes you seven years to build the company, maybe ten. Um, someone who says to you, in three years' time, I expect you to have made a bundle of money. Well, okay, maybe in Silicon Valley you can do that, but we're not in Silicon Valley at the moment. So let's be realistic about it. Those exits... Um, so agree it right from the get-go. What is your objective on that? Is it to sell the business to a third party? You may not actually want that. You may want to continue running the business and to say goodbye to the investors and thank you for your money and here's the money I've made for you, but goodbye, I'm going carrying on with it. Or you may want to say, I'm an entrepreneur, I built this business, I'm going to sell this business, and I'm going to go off and build another business. And I like building early stage businesses, and that's my job. And I don't want this one to be forever and a day. You may say, actually, I rather like this, um, and I want this to be part of my family going on. Okay, be very transparent about that right up front, because they need to understand it. They need to understand where you're coming from. Where they're coming from is much simpler, but they need to understand where you're coming from. Um, on those exits, and I mentioned puts a little bit earlier, please try and avoid a put if you can. Because anything built into the shareholders agreement which gives one or other party the right to force the other party to sell or buy the business at a particular price which is related to, inevitably it tends to be related to the way the business is going, is going to cause tensions. The, you know, from my experience, the last year before the exercise of a put is horrible in terms of the relationship because you've got this really big wall facing you. And you know that in 12 months time, you have got to find suddenly two and a half million to buy these people out. And you don't know where that money's going to come from because it's not being generated in the business. And the reason it's two and a half million is because that's a multiple of your profit. So what do you do? Simple. Don't make a profit. You look at the business, you run the business at a lower level, you don't quite have the revenue numbers that, you're, that they were expecting or you were expecting. All of these are ways for you to actually manipulate, and you inside the business can do that in a way that the investors can't. You can manipulate the business so that actually what drives the end price to you is actually lower. Now, that doesn't, you know, the investors know what's happening. They look, they see this happening. You say, oh, the market's rough. It's just not happening. I'm just not getting the sales and everything suddenly got more expensive and so on. They're not fools. They know what's happening. And so the relationship between you and the board meetings during that last year will be very unpleasant. So just try and avoid it from the get-go. Say, I don't want to be in that position. Let's find another mechanism. Or you find a different way of defining what that cost is going to be. In, in, in this discussion as well, just beware um, of other structures which will come in related to ratchets, they're called, which are ways of multiplying or reducing your ownership related to performance. Very often that happens when you think the business is worth a lot more than they do, and they say, okay, well, we believe you. Um, we don't actually believe you now, but we believe you may be able to make it. So what we'll do is we'll say, at the moment, this is how much we're prepared to pay for the business. But if you manage to do that, to achieve that, then we'll give you that much more. Okay, sounds great. 
but actually just be very careful about that, how that's structured, because if something external happens, you know, if, if a Brexit comes in or some other external force happens, and it really is not your fault and not your problem, at the same time they will say, well, sorry, you didn't perform, so you don't get that equity. And by the time you come to an exit, you're left with very little return compared to all the sweat you put in, and that leaves a lot of bitterness around. So try and avoid that if you can. And, and finally, um, try and recognize that you and the investors should actually be allies. You should be allies, you should be negotiating allies, and your biggest actual sort of target is to negotiate a sale to a third party, and you should be in lockstep on that. Too often, you're not in lockstep. The investor needs to get out more quickly, and you're saying, well, actually, the time's not quite right. We need another six months. And the investor says, oh, no, I'm in a fund, and I've got to get my money back to my investors, and I haven't got time. I'm up again. Those are the problems that you need to avoid, and you need to be absolutely aligned on timing and as allies, how do we together make money by selling the business? Probably the biggest straightforward mistake is not being very clear. If you, if you waffle, if you're lost, you've lost it from the get-go. Go in very clearly from the beginning with a good strategy, clear, concise, and just articulate it well. That is, I said earlier, don't worry about the 30 second elevator pitch, but actually this is where your elevator pitch comes in. This is where the investor has key points stuck in their mind from what you've said because that is the way this business is going to go and it's very clear, bang. And that's got to become almost the leitmotif or the sort of motto that they are going to be using when they are themselves talking to their colleagues, when they're talking to their investment committee, they need to be able to say, what is this business about? In very simple language and in three sentences. So that's the first thing. Don't be too fluffy. I've been looking very recently at a project in Africa in the energy sector. And the pitch, the presentation is so dense. It's got so much detail. It's got so many ideas in it. And it's just covered in pictures of generators and solar panels in Africa and so on, that I got lost. Mm. Frankly, I got lost. I was trying to say to myself, what are these people really trying to do? It's, it's, it's a picture book, but it's not actually a storybook. Okay? So be very clear and articulate. That's, that's important. Know your business. And this, you know, this is about mistakes. So what I'm telling you is things to do as opposed to just the dense. Mm -hmm. Do know your business very well. Know the market, know the competition, know what is going to be substitute products as well. Don't just think about direct competition, but think about product substitution. Know your pricing. And all of these should be translated into very clear assumptions in your business model. And it's got to be so easy for an investor to look and say, okay, so if the market is 25 million people, what happens if actually there is a problem and there is an economic challenge and actually your accessible market is only 15 million people? What does that really mean? Okay. Or what happens if there is a product that is similar to yours that comes on the market? Um, you know, instead of a solar panel, someone's able to produce uh, uh, little micro hydro plants in the river nearby. How does that knock your business sideways. Be very clear on your assumptions and very clear on, on, on that. Um, on the don'ts, don't have an irrationally optimistic business case. You know, it, it, we all love to see those graphs that go up there in the top right hand corner and none of us believe it. There's a, I was told by the chairman of, of, of a fund that I was working in many years ago and she said to me, um, she said, Piers, you know what we used to say in the business? You don't, there's no point going to the first board meeting after the investment because all they do is they actually show you the rebased business case where the graph goes flat as opposed to up to the top right hand corner. So there's no point going to it because you know it's going to happen anyway. That raises a key point. Look perhaps yourself at putting forward a pessimistic case. 
don't just stick with your management case, the best case scenario. Actually, put forward a case which says, that's where we think it's going to go, but if there are two bad harvests, this is where the product is going to be, or this is where our, our business is going to be. And that way you're helping the investors, because they're going to do that themselves, but you're helping them to understand that you've thought about it, that you've actually worked out what the implications are. That is absolutely critical as part of this building confidence as well, which I talked about earlier, building the trust with, with the investors. Other, other, other points, I think, that um, mistakes that sometimes come across, entrepreneurs don't always listen. Entrepreneurs are people with a lot of oomph, a lot of energy. They know they're right, and that's why we love them, because they're going to hit a wall and they go through the wall. They don't sort of run away from it, and that's why we love them. Sometimes it means they don't listen, and they get caught up in their own story. They get mesmerized by their business, and they don't actually listen to the, and see the signals that are coming back from the investors. Listen carefully. Just because you know, the investor is, if they're getting interested, they're going to start engaging in conversation. They're going to be wanting to talk to you. They're going to be wanting to ask you questions. Let them listen. Think about their questions, because all of those questions are coming from some little doubt in the back of their mind that they want to try and understand. Help them to do that. Don't just stick on your pitch. Don't hustle. No. Don't speed them up. Don't push them. Don't be arrogant. You know your business better than they do, but they know an awful lot about business as well because they've been around the block a few times. And actually, just be your own nice, confident self. Okay? Now, in order to get there, one of the best things to do is practice. Get some friends, your mentor, and practice your pitch. Practice running through investor pitches before you meet the real live investor. Do your rehearsals. It, it sounds silly, it sounds simple. Very few people do it, but actually it makes a huge difference. You know, that first, some people say, oh, well, you know, the first investor I see, that'll be my practice. Well, that's a pity because you've actually lost the possibility of catching that first investor. You, you may be lucky but all you're doing is honing your skills on them, whereas actually you're trying to get money out of them. So practice, rehearse, get yourself ready for it. I suppose the final point really, um, don't embroider, don't be, I said earlier, don't be irrationally optimistic, but also just don't embroider who you are. Don't go overboard describing your wonderful skills and capabilities. Be brutally honest about yourself, and you can be positively honest, but be honest, because they're going to go into so much due diligence, they will be asking people, you know, is Jane really as good as she says she is? Uh, has Joe actually done that? It sounds implausible. Was it really true? Wow, if it was, that's great. But don't over oversell yourself, just be very honest. Um, and recognize that that due diligence is going to be very detailed. So really in conclusion on this, I think the key points are be very clear, concise, articulate about your strategy. Give them in three sentences buzzwords and the sense of the strategy so that they can repeat that to their colleagues. It sticks with them. Be very, very clear on that. Don't be irrationally optimistic. Don't don't try and put in a business plan that is just simply only going to work if all the stars are aligned. Be much more pragmatic. Thirdly, be very honest about what you can do and your team can do. Really describe yourselves very clearly and just don't over-exaggerate. And then finally, don't push, don't hustle. Listen to them and don't hustle and oversell. We've all been there. There's nothing quite as dispiriting as going in to see an investor and hearing them say those fatal words of, we really like your project, it's a fantastic project and we think you're a great person to do it. The only problem is that you're looking for $100,000 and actually our minimum is 250000 Dispiriting, very dispiriting. And I'm afraid that the, it happens 
One of the things you've got to do is really research your investors up front to make sure you know that you're going to be in their sweet spot. At the same time, you don't have to be totally dispirited by it because there may be, provided it's not too big a gap, there may be some ways to talk your way through that and to actually try and get them a little bit more excited. But probably the first message is just do your research to know where you should be. Um, the problem overall with small deals, and many of us have worked in the field with very small transactions, small investments, with small entrepreneurs or small businesses that big entrepreneurs are making, but it's still small businesses. And, and one of the big problems is simply that um, it takes as much time and it costs as much to make an investment in a 100000 dollar deal as in a $1 million deal or even a $10 million deal. There's not a big difference in terms of the due diligence process. There's not a big difference in terms of the understanding of the product. There's not a big difference, frankly, even in the cost of the legal work that has to go into it, the writing of agreements, etc., and contracts, etc. There's not a big difference in that. But there's a real difference in terms of the return and interest for the investor. So let me just put that in perspective. You know, we've all heard about the, the sort of classic investor interest is in return in terms of percentages, what is the IRR that the investor is going to make, and returns in terms of cash, the multiple of cash. We've probably all heard also about carried interest. Now, carried interest is, just a quick reminder, it is the percentage that the investor is going to get out of the total, uh, that the investor as the investment manager is going to get out of the total cash that is generated by that investment. Typically, there's a sort of rule of thumb that it's 20%. So let's say that you generate a million dollars of profit for the investor, they're going to get $200,000 coming to them. The rest of it goes to the people on whose behalf they're investing the money. Now, the problem with that is very simple. A small deal, which generates 100000 is only going to generate $20,000. $20,000 split amongst a team of three, four investors is not nearly as much as 200000 split amongst that team. So there's a real challenge and dynamic there. And you know, investors start small and they progressively want to do bigger deals because that's how they're rewarded. That's where the incentives lie. So there is a challenge, there's a big challenge for anyone who's doing small transactions. And you have to find people who are looking really at the, um, either investors who are dedicated to that space, and there are an increasing number of them who are dedicated to the space, who may be doing it for an impact uh, investment thesis, but at the same time clearly have good commercial uh, interests. So it is a big challenge. Now, one of the things that you can look at in order to try and interest the investor is to say, okay, what I need now is 100,000, but as my business grows, I'm gonna need another 150,000 in two years time. And so can we look at this please, not just as a 100,000 investment, but can we look at it as a program of investment? Can we look at it as a schedule over three years that actually meets your requirement as opposed to just the one off now. It may work, it may not work, but it's worth a try. But at the same time, when you're doing it, be realistic. I mean, you're not, you're not going to try, you're not going to persuade them um, that suddenly from 100,000 now, you're going to need 2 million. You've got to be within range. Um, but it is, it, is, it is worth trying to do that because Otherwise, um, I'm afraid it's a very difficult gap to bridge, this one between the investor interest in big transactions and your need for a small amount of money. But, but do, do think about staging, therefore. Stage your capital requirements explicitly. Talk about it as, as, as staging. Let, let, let me say, though, also, as part of the context on this, that um, don't be in too much of a hurry to um, say, oh, I can change, I can change for you, because you lose credibility. Mm. You know what you need, you know you've worked out the cash, you know why you need it. You don't want them to put too much in, because otherwise you lose a part of your equity as well. 
So don't be in too much of a hurry to suddenly say, oh, I can, I can, I can do this because you want me to. Um, but at the same time, be ready to be flexible. And if the investors are saying, well, okay, now, if we dimensioned this business differently, could you, would you be able to scale it differently? If you think you might be able to, then say, okay, yeah, let's look at it, but I'm not going to give you a firm answer now. I need to go and think about it. I need to go away. I need to really do my numbers and calculate, etc. cetera. Um, because you don't want to suddenly say yes, because you're not ready for it. You won't have a coherent answer. Coming back to the subject of um, impact investing, I mean, it's become increasingly clear that there, are, that there is a major need for capital to support small businesses. It's very easy to find capital for big buyouts, etc. But growth capital for small businesses is, is rare. And the, there is, there's been, perhaps over the last 10 years, an increasing number, 10, maybe even 15, number of opportunities for accessing that capital. There are more and more either funds or investors some of them philanthropic, some of them driven uh, you know, microfinance, which is not philanthropic, it makes a great deal of return, but at the same time it provides accessible capital. Um, an increasing number of investors around who are prepared to be catalytic and who will calculate their returns not only in terms of cash, but also in terms of the impact that their, their investment makes. They will expect, as investors, to apply the disciplines of commercial investing. They may be prepared to say, but instead of a 20% return, I'm comfortable with a 12% return, because at the same time I know I'm making a significant impact in a society or in a particular geography or economy, etc. Um, do look for them. Do search them out, but at the same time, do expect when you're talking to them that they will be disciplined and that they will expect you to be, and they will want to behave like a, uh, a Silicon Valley venture capitalist applying all of that discipline. Um, they may, at the last minute, though, be prepared to consider a different return interest. And you need to understand that. Or they may, if you're, for example, in Africa, they may say, well, we are African investors. We therefore don't apply a risk premium for Africa to our return. So we're not going to say it's got to be 7% higher than the return we get out of the US because it's Africa. Because they'll say we're actually inside the African tent. We understand African risk and we can manage without having to go to that. So look for people like that. Look for the savvy investors, the locally savvy investors. Um, don't try and persuade someone who's going to look at you and say, sorry, but that's just way out for us, because then you'll have a problem. Just really to summarize on this, this issue of big investments versus big deals versus small deals, um, it, it's a very difficult gap to bridge. And you really should, I think my advice is really you've got to prepare yourself in advance and really understand whether the investors whose time you're trying to take up are people who are going to be comfortable coming in at the size that you're looking at. Second point, you can think about perhaps looking at staging, which may reach up to the scale that they're looking for, um, and that's a, 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 a possibility. And the third thing is really look also for um, that new ecosystem of impact and sustainability investors who are particularly interested in um, trying to build uh, small businesses because they are the ones whose jobs are really focused on investing in small companies.